Good morning, everyone. It is a moment to celebrate. It is with great joy that I announce that our Board of Trustees has invited Reverend Dr. Deborah Hafner to be our interim minister for the next two years. And she has said yes. <laughs> we welcome Reverend Deborah as a strong leader with excellent Sunday worship skills, broad experience in running organizations, and a great love for our community. Reverend Deborah will complete her part time transitions ministry with us at the end of June and she will become our full-time interim minister on August 1st. She intends to relocate to Long Island full-time by September 1st. We can look forward to our hearts and spirits being nourished while our minds and hands are kept busy with the work of rebuilding and reimagining our community in preparation for our next settled minister. Please take a moment to thank our interim search team, including Ken Bewley Newmar, Gerard Neighbor, Bob Bader, Lisa Burby, and Michael Goldsmith for their diligence and commitment to this process and to this wonderful end. On behalf, <laughs> on behalf of our board, we welcome you to join us in this next exciting step in our fellowship's journey with Reverend Deborah. She has sent a warm video message to our members, which you can view at home or stay on at the end of the service, and we will play it here for you. Our opening words today are from psychologist Stephen Asma author of Why We Need Religion. Religion provides moral structure, existential value, universal purpose. In short, the gravitas of existence, pre-made and road tested. Religion gives us a transcendental luster to the mundane everyday experience. There are many forms of human suffering that are beyond the reach of any scientific or secular alleviation. Religion is a form of emotional management and its value does not lie in whether it is true or false, but whether it consoles and humanizes us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenna kern -Rugiel. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Huntington's hybrid multi-platform Sunday service. We are streaming live from our sanctuary in Huntington. So please be patient with any technical delays or glitches we may experience. For those of you joining us on Zoom, please feel free to use the chat box to say hello. We are also streaming live on Facebook. A big hello to those of you joining us there. We would also like to extend a special welcome to visitors joining us for the first time here or virtually, as well as any newcomers who are returning. If you would like to learn more about us, feel free to speak with someone after the service if you are here or let us know in the chat, or you can email us at office at uufh.org. Know that whoever you are, whomever you love, and wherever you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. We have a few announcements. Today at 4 p.m., we are holding a virtual memorial gathering for Dorothy Burns, who passed away at the age of 91 on April 8th. Dorothy was a longtime UUFH member and served the fellowship in many capacities. To find the link for the Zoom, please visit our website at uufh.org and click on News and Events. Our Mother's Day service on May 8th is going to be a very special event as our staff is creating a video that will celebrate moms. Please send an email with a photo of your mother and also of you and your children if you'd like to Sandra at office at uufh.org. Sandra suggested that you use your smartphone to take pictures of older photos and email them to her, and you can contact her if you have any questions. With the support of the fellowship, our members Eric and Jim Rubin Perez have been working with the town of Huntington to create the first annual Family Pride Picnic. This joyful event 
which will be held on June 26th at, at Mill Dam Park, will feature friends, fun, and music, and show our youth that Huntington is an affirming and supportive community for LGBTQ plus individuals and families. Visit this week's flash for the details. And finally, bidding ends today on our auction items at 3 p.m., so please get in your final bids. Today's speaker is Milt Mazur. Milt was born in Brooklyn and received his undergraduate degree from CCNY. He attended Albert Einstein Medical School with residencies at Brookdale, Mount Sinai, and Montefiore Hospitals. He had a private practice in internal medicine on Long Island until he retired in 2014. Milt is a former member of the Ethical Humanist Society. He and his wife, Prue Emery, have been active members here at the fellowship for more than 10 years, and Milt is also a member of our choir. And now, I invite you to settle into your bodies and quiet your minds as we breathe deeply together and enter our time of worship. Please join me in saying our mission statement. The words will be on the screen. In religious community, we nurture our individual spirits through caring for one another and helping to heal the world. And now please join me here and at home in singing our affirmation, Common Ground. The words will be on the screen. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. Good morning. Today I'm going to talk about some of the conflicts surrounding the war between faith and science. I was inspired to do so after reading a New York Times article by the American Anglican priest, Tish Harrison Warren, which discussed how rejection of vaccination and public health measures against COVID-19 considerably raised the sickness and death stakes in the war between faith and science and against science itself. A terrible price that civilization paid and is still paying. I realized that there was a, a war not only between religion and science, but also against religion in itself and also a war against science in itself. My goal today is to define some of the elements of these three wars between religion and science, against religion, and against science, and to try to lessen some of the conflict. To begin with, the article by Reverend Warren states that she believes that God created the world, but she doesn't worry about the details. She was taught that the book of Genesis was like a poem or a hymn, not a scientific textbook, and the biblical creation accounts were a theological claim, not a cosmological or astrophysical explanation. She happened to rub shoulders while at college with many scientists who were passionate about their religious faith as well as science and who saw a scientific methodology as a wonderful gift from God to help explore the world. So she was emotionally inclined to ignore conversations that pit science and faith against each other. She had found a way of living with both by ignoring the fracas. When the COVID pandemic arrived, she found it easy to trust biomedical researchers and physicians because she knew them personally 
and often worshiped with him on Sundays. However, she acknowledges that many people see the work of God and the work of science in opposition. She views that opposition as a false dichotomy with potentially disastrous consequences and notes that white evangelicals are the least likely religionists to accept vaccination, mask protection, and science in general. And these evangelicals tend to lean Republican politically and that Republicans in general are also less likely to accept vaccination and protective masks. However, I should mention that there are also appropriate questions about the safety and efficacy of any vaccine or mask. Those questions don't depend on political or religious leanings or denial of vaccines and public health measures in general. I'm not questioning uh, uh, their validity. Reverend Warren explored the problem of vaccine and mask denial and discussed the matter with the scientist director of BioLogos, an organization to further the accommodation of faith and science, founded by the past director of the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins. The scientist director of BioLogos acknowledged the faith versus science dichotomy, but indicated that at the beginning of the scientific revolution, many famous scientists were religious believers motivated by their faith. It was only after Darwin's theory of natural selection and adaptation, explaining the evolution of living things was published in 1859 that the dichotomy between faith and science began in earnest. A well-publicized dispute took place in 1925, the Tennessee Scopes Monkey Trial, so-called, in which William Bri Jennings Bryan prosecuted John Scopes, the teacher who dared to contradict the fundamentalist view of creationism, that God created everything, by referring to Darwin's theory of evolution in his teaching. The jury found that Scopes had violated the law, but his fine was rescinded on the basis of a technicality. However, for many years and in many states, laws were passed which forbade the teaching of Darwin's theory, and it was only in the mid-20th century that these laws were finally rescinded. In addition, attempts to teach intelligent design, so-called, which is considered to be a thinly disguised form of the religious concept of creationism, are still promulgated even in the current era. The dichotomy was worsened around the issue of stem cell research, euthanasia, and abortion. And according to Reverend Warren, but more so because of a latent cultural assumption that faith and fact oppose each other. The author cites a Christian research and polling finding that significantly fewer teens and young adults see science and faith as complementary, a result of each viewpoint disparaging or mocking the other. Reverend Warren acknowledges that some Christians of faith are opposed to evidence and don't accept faith based on, on evidence. And in reaction, this attitude tends to make scientists dismissive of religious faith. She believes that people should accept science as a gift from God as many scientists do. She also recognizes that science doesn't solve every problem and that scientists should recognize that religion is a way of dealing with life's biggest and often unanswerable questions. She suggests that the common ground between religion and science is the search for truth. But the author of another article by the psychologist Stephen Asma indicates that religious extremism clings to hidden doctrines despite evidence to the contrary. 
He too refers to the 1925 Scopes monkey trial in Dayton, Tennessee, in which John Scopes was found guilty of teaching about Darwin evolution, a theory which violated a state law forbidding the teaching of any theory denying divine creation of human beings or asserting our descent from lower animals. Although Clarence Darrow, Scopes' lawyer, lost the case, he succeeded in establishing that the logic, of, the logic of scriptural literalism as claimed by the prosecuting attorney, William Jennings Bryan, was impossible by establishing that the six-day creation story of Genesis didn't involve literal 24-hour days. As a result, the heavily publicized trial had the effect of splitting American Christianity into an evangelical fundamentalist branch, which interpreted the Bible literally, versus a modern reform branch, which interpreted the Bible symbolically and metaphorically. Other forms of religious fanaticism, such as Muslim militant jihadi struggle, apply literal actions to Quranic admonitions, even sacrificial killing of human beings for puritanical religious abstractions, thus again revealing the flaws of extreme religious belief. But Asma also cites the corresponding extreme hostility of secular progressives' dismissal of religion as misguided and intrinsically false and even dangerous. He indicates that religion is usually about human flourishing and is adaptive. He cites philosophers who see joyful flourishing, including charity towards others as the purpose of religion and the evils of religion as arising from religious asceticism. The false belief that God wants you to harm yourself or others through sacrifice or coercion. However, he points out that in a pluralistic society with so many different points of view, there has to be a separation of religion and government for both practical and philosophic reasons. Coerced charity and forced belief are contradictions in terms. Asma states that the problem is that religion is rarely understood correctly. It isn't about cognitive beliefs or subjugating happiness to God's demands. It is about actions, not belief or faith. Rewards and punishments relate to those actions, not to beliefs. We should be inspired, but not literally overzealous or crushed into submission. When we are joyful and rational and recognize that others need our help, we fulfill God's plan. And sometimes that does require self-negation, but God doesn't need our help. Asma wrote the book, Why We Need Religion, which references neuroscience, psychology, and evolution theory. His thesis is that religion provides therapeutic management of our emotional lives. Religion consoles us, reduces stress and depression, and is communal glue, providing meaning and purpose, focusing fear on adversaries, and giving us hope and inspiration. Religious social activities and rituals create positive bonds with other people which are comforting and uplifting. Consoling behaviors and contemplation of death and immortality help to, to alleviate anxiety. Ritual and traditional ceremonies also calm and distract people. Asma says that prayer may provide the illusion that we can change our fate. We all have a neurologically based quote unquote seeking system, which is aroused to satisfy our physiologic and emotional needs. We can usually seek and gain equilibrium physically, but not always emotionally. For example, dealing with grief, although religious and social community 
may ameliorate grief. Asthma suggests that religious rituals may make sense out of the irrational, reducing anxiety and consoling us when we are overwhelmed by the loss. The consolation of human care is transferred to God and made absolute. Asthma asks, why don't we remove the religious overlay and settle for the many psychological, social, and physiologic benefits in secular human activities? He thinks that a crucial element would be missing in non-spiritual alternatives to religion, and that the many negative elements sometimes found in religion, such as chauvinism, sexism, racism, violence, ignorance, and hypocrisy should be reformed rather than discarding religion per se. Religion has been an enormous reservoir of guidance, inspiration, and support, and to produce such a reservoir from scratch produces paltry results compared to the thousands of years of cultural evolution in established religion. As my adds, and religion is uniquely vital for personal and group identity. It's the upside of tribalism, which is acceptable unless it is corrupted by failure to share or by selfishness. He adds that religion is uniquely potent and can't easily be substituted for by secularism because religion has more gravitas a greater dignity and seriousness. The idea that God is dead and we must create the meaning in our own lives has empowered some people to do great things. But he points out it hasn't scaled up to society at large. So there'll be more discussion about these subjects in a little while after the interlude. Now I invite us all to sing Spirit of Life. Following the song, we will enter into a time of silence, followed by a brief prayer. As you participate here in the sanctuary and at home, it is not about the perfection of silence, but the intention. Please join me now in singing Spirit of Life. This week has once again brought many assaults on values we hold dear. May this time of quiet be an opportunity to touch peace within ourselves, to tap new springs of courage, resolve, and hope. We know that none of us alone can hold all that must be held or do all that must be done, but may each of us be led toward that work which is ours to do. And as a community, May we feel our strength together and use it for good as best we can. 
In this spirit, we name our concern for this land and for its people and for the people of the world. May all who are moved to action in these times be clear and strong and compassionate in our response. We also hold all those tender personal concerns which are close to our hearts this day. I invite those of you here in the sanctuary to say aloud the names you would like to lift up into the care of this community. And I will repeat them so those at home can hear. I also invite those of you on Zoom to enter the names of those you would like to lift up into the chat box so that I may read them aloud or simply hold them in your heart in silence. Ruth Ann, Mary, Mary. John, John. Carol. Carol, Peter, Peter. Crumby, Ross, Ross. 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 Rosalind, Rosalind. Tom. Tom, Becky, Becky. Neil, and Neil and Marianne. Matthew, may they be well and may they feel the love that surrounds them. Let us take a moment to give thanks for the blessings emerging even now for our exciting future together with a new full-time interim minister. For ordinary people, including you and me, who are rising to the occasion and bringing the best that is in us as best we can, we give thanks. We close with a few more breaths in silence. May it be so, amen. Our split plate charity for this month is the Helping Hand Rescue Mission in Huntington Station. The Helping Hand Rescue Mission seeks to improve the spiritual and temporal conditions of the children, families, and people of the communities they serve. Their pantry provides for approximately 200 to 250 families per week with fresh produce, fruit, eggs, and more. Their dining room recently suffered water damage due to a burst pipe so contributions are especially needed now. You can send a check to the office or donate through the website. For more information, see this week's flash. In a moment, I will invite you, those of you here in the sanctuary, to stand as you are able and join in singing the hymn, Where Do We Come From? But first, some background. Paul Gauguin painted Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? in Tahiti in 1897. You can see it on the screen. The painting is considered a philosophical work comparable to the themes of the Bible. There are three major themes in the painting from right to left. The three crouched women with a sleeping child on the right represent the beginning of life. The middle group symbolizes the daily existence of adulthood. And in the final group, according to the artist, quote, an old woman approaching death appears reconciled and resigned to her thoughts. At her feet is a strange white bird representing the futility of words. The blue idol in the background represents what Gauguin described as the beyond. In the top left corner, Gauguin wrote in French the words, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Isabella will play through one verse and then we'll be helped out by Steve from our choir. The words will be on the screen. Please stand as you are able. And those of you at home, please join in as well, but please keep your mics on mute.
now Milt will uh, read part two of his service. Faith is supposed to be a struggle, a striving toward belief, a difficult overcoming, not a denial of doubt. The history of faith is one of people trying to find God, spirituality, or unity in a way that adds meaning and mystery to a purely material world. The author of those words who recognizes the value of faith in human nature is the anthropologist, physician, and self-described atheist, Melvin Connor, who has explored many different societies he notes that war after war has been spurred by the convictions of religious uniqueness and the wish to dominate and predate, although this is less common nowadays. Most people of faith recognize that other billions of the faithful have different beliefs which must be tolerated and that freedom of thought includes freedom of faith. He recognizes that people with no religious faith are growing in numbers, which he ascribes to modernization and affluence. But he doubts that faith will fade away, even as religion becomes less coercive. Connor objects to attacks on other people's faith by atheists. Although he accepts some of their criticisms of religion and tries to understand the many cultural and physiologic basis for faith, he rejects the idea sometimes expressed that religion is at the root of human evil, even though religion has sometimes been murderously fanatic. He reminds us that religious fanaticism has been dwarfed by the political fanaticism of Nazism, Stalinism, Maoism, and the non-religious genocides of Armenia, Indonesia, Cambodia, and Rwanda, as well as many others, including right-wing and left-wing terrorism. Connor accuses belligerent atheists of not being true cosmopolitans because they fail to recognize the legitimacy of motivation other than pure reason, to the point of embracing what amounts to intellectual fundamentalism, excluding all other forms of belief, including believing things for which there is no evidence. Connor states that faith involves a strong set of inclinations and ideas, that are not universal, but are so widespread and deeply ingrained that in his view, faith will never go away. The movement against religion is also a form of faith, he states, defining religion as irrational, harmful, and needful of disappearing from human experience. Connor states that many atheists claim that religion results from indoctrination in childhood, Yet many scientists and philosophers who grew up antagonistic to their parental teachings and were exposed to contrary ideas still accept religious beliefs. He challenges the notion that religion dupes people into accepting a pack of lies and cites the observable and measurable good done by religion. He also notes that rational thought may exclude conscious recognition of our emotions. But both rational and emotional thoughts are based on brain function, although this does not address whether faith should make sense to believers. The author lists the many criticisms of the religious faith that have been made, acknowledges their value, and states that the criticisms can be pursued without necessarily abandoning faith. Connor maintains that faith is the conviction of things unseen. In the ab absence of evidence, human beings experience a metaphorical leap of faith. However, 
Even though science and technology also thrive on a type of faith, a faith founded on the basis of evidence, sometimes even viewed as a gift from God, rejection of the scientific enterprise in itself is widespread. The psychologist and linguist Steven Pinker writes on the intellectual war on science noting not only widespread rejection by religious fundamentalists, as is often voiced, but also by many intellectuals and institutions of higher learning. He points out that the liberal arts world is disdainful towards scientific ideas and ignores them, omitting discussing them. He refers to the writings of C.P. Snow in his time a well-known chemist and novelist, attempting to bridge the humanist and scientific cultures, an idea which met with vituperative rejection in the literary world. He finds that many intellectuals see science as mere puzzle solving rather than seeking the truth, and impugn enlightenment science and reason for crimes present from the beginning of civilization such as racism, slavery, conquest, and genocide. Some of these anti-scientist intellectuals have concocted theories that science has influenced government to remake society and even suggest that this science led to the Holocaust, blaming this horrible chapter of civilization on modernity rather than the Nazis. Pinker points out that these theorists have it backwards. Genocide and autocracy were ubiquitous for thousands of years, and science and enlightenment values decreased genocide, uh, genocide and autocracy, especially after World War II. However, Pinker admits that sometimes science has been pressed into supporting deplorable political movements pseudo-scientific racism, employing erroneous cranial measurements and mental testing were used by the Nazis to support the existence of a mental capacity hierarchy in the human species, with Northern Europeans at the top, ideas that were eventually reversed by better science and the recognition of the horrors of Nazism. Ideological racism is not science and is not related to Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and adaptation. In fact, the intellectualized racism in the West in the 19th century was not the brainchild of science, but the brainchild of the humanities, history, classics, and mythology. The misperception that a superior race of Aryan white men gave rise to the German Teutonic folk also saw other ethnic groups as mongrel races. Pinker points out that these racist perceptions had nothing to do with Darwin's evolution theories and that Hitler and his supporters rejected Darwin's theories and considered races to be separate species which would degenerate if mixed. Darwin saw humans as a single species with common ancestry, similar mental capacity, and no harm from interbreeding. Pseudoscientific racism sprang from religious, artistic, intellectual, and political beliefs of the era with little input from the scientific world. In another vein, science and humanities scholars have clashed for decades over the nature of scientific truth, acknowledging the enormous benefits of science, but also noting the huge threats. Pinker points out that unfairly, such equivocation is not applied to other disciplines and that science simply prefers understanding and know-how to ignorance and superstition. He objects to this demonization of science by the liberal arts, driving unsure students away from science because they are taught that science is just another narrative, 
like religion or mythology, which does not make progress and which rationalizes racism, sexism, and genocide. This stigmatization of science, together with institutional review bureaucracy concerning experimental studies, curbs opinions and bogs down research with overly oppressive barriers, which may even deny consenting adults potentially beneficial treatments. Pinker points out that the greatest payoff in, in, in instilling an appreciation for science is for, some, is for everyone to think more scientifically. Psychologists have shown that humans are subject to crippling biases and fallacies. But science allows us to work around these human vulnerabilities by looking for evidence. Correlation is not causation. Anecdotal evidence has limited applicability. Statistical quantification is far more accurate than intuition. Although he acknowledges its limitations, statistical quantification is an improvement in judgment over to intuition. For example, he asks the general question whether nonviolent political resistance produces positive change or not, and cites reviews of political resistance movements over a hundred year period, which showed that three quarters of the nonviolent political movements succeeded, and only one third of the violent political movements succeeded. If these facts were widespread, political opposition movements might have a basis to become both more moral and more effective by being nonviolent. Pinker suggests one of the greatest potential contributions of modern science may be a deeper integration with the humanities. He indicates that the humanities are in trouble downsizing with morale and student numbers diminishing because of anti-intellectual cultural trends and the commercialization of universities. However, he also blames failure of the humanities to fully recover from the criticism of Western civilization portrayed as culturally pessimistic and liberal democracy portrayed even as fascistic. He suggests that new insights could come from harmonious relations between science and the humanities. Scientific understanding of human connections and human nature could illuminate culture and society. The humanities applying scientific investigation could produce an agenda to attract talent and financial support. This consilience between humanities and science has already occurred in the fields of archaeology, philosophy of mind, logic, linguistics, cognition, and neuroscience. Such consilience could also be applied in political theory, visual arts, musicology, and literature, especially by applying digital data analytics. Pinker acknowledges that sometimes these types of explorations have been criticized as shallow and simplistic, and his response to that is all the more reason for the humanities to reach out and combine their erudition about individual works and genres with scientific insight into human emotions and aesthetic response. He closes his paper with a quote, in 1782, Thomas Paine extolled the cosmopolitan virtues of science. Science, the partisan of no country, but the beneficent patroness of all, has liberally opened a temple where all may meet. Her influence on the mind, like the sun on the chilled earth, has long been preparing it for higher cultivation and further improvement. The philosopher of one country sees not an enemy in the philosopher of another. He takes his seat in the temple of science and asks not who sits beside him. 
In closing, it seems clear that religion and science should both acknowledge their values and their limitations and recognize these institutions of society as well as others as enriching our quest for truth and flourishing in our lives. Science and religion, technology, education, and the humanities are all sorcerer's apprentices. We extinguish this chalice flame, daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith, that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth. Those of you here in the sanctuary are invited to join us in the social hall and garden for coffee. Please be aware that this is an unmasked space. We also have lots of leftover desserts from last night. But first, please enjoy this video message from our new interim minister, Reverend Dr. Deborah W. Hafner. Good 
day, friends. I am so delighted to accept the board's offer to be your interim minister for the next two years. I've had such a wonderful time being your transitions minister. I've loved working with the staff. I've loved working with the executive committee and the board of directors. I've loved meeting with those of you who are committee chairs and getting to know some of you on Sunday mornings in person when I'm in Huntington. I feel like I've been received so warmly. I had no intention of applying to be here interim minister when I applied for the targeted position. But to be honest, I fell in love with you. I think you're such a great congregation. Yes, we have work to do in the next couple of years as you prepare for your next settled minister. We have a lot to process, don't we, coming out of the pandemic. A lot of grief, personal, as well as about things that have happened in the congregation. But we also have so much to celebrate. You not only survived, you're actually thriving. And I am so much looking forward to working with you as you determine your future goals, what kind of congregation you want to be, what's important to you, what's your next strategic plan, and what's your next vision? Who can you be? Who do you want to be? Know that I believe in my whole heart with shared ministry, shared ministry with the congregation, shared ministry with the congregation's leaders, shared ministry with the staff, shared ministry with important community partners. I'm so excited about the next two years, and I look forward to growing with you. Thank you. Couldn't, couldn't imagine a better way to end today's service. Um, for those of you on Zoom, enjoy your day. Thanks, everyone.